My name is Jeff Handmaker. I work here at the International Institute of Social Studies. Um, I'm head of a project called the Legal Mobilization Project, which does research and is also teaching on issues around legal mobilization. And we also have the secretariat for something called the Legal Mobilization Platform. And I mention this because the platform is actually a space through which academics and those working for various civil society organizations, the real work of social justice, can encounter each other, can inform each other, can inspire each other, can help each other. And it's very rare to have these kind of spaces, and that's why we consider it quite a special space. This room is therefore kind of an extension of that space. Um, and here we are um, to discuss uh, the case um, that Mr. Ismail Ziada and his family have brought against um, two Israeli military commanders. We'll get to the details in a moment. So what I want to do, basically by way of kind of background, huh? because for some of you, it's going to be quite new. We have been following for the last two and a half months what's been happening in Gaza. And indeed, we all kind of need to take a deep breath when we think about what's happening here in Gaza. Um, this case is really about, I would say, it's about many things, but certainly about three main things. And the first is a failure to learn, a failure to learn certainly from history, and in particular, a failure to learn from even recent history. This case has to do with events that took place in 2014, but still here in 2023, we have what you see here on the screen, continuing atrocity crimes. So that's the second uh, thing which this is about, and that's seeking justice for atrocity crimes, in particular for Mr. Ismail Ziada, who's with us here today. We're grateful, Mr. Ziada, that you've joined us and his family. But as he has often mentioned, it's also seeking justice for Palestinians generally who've experienced atrocity crimes. And third, and that's of course a big reason why all of you are here and so many of you are here with us online, um, this case is about solidarity for all victims of such atrocities, wherever they may take place. From a, a solidarity uh, coming from lawyers in this particular instance, including my colleagues at the table here, uh, from students, from trade unionists, from academics, from social justice activists, including uh, those who are involved in the anti-apartheid campaign concerning South Africa, nowadays involved also in an anti-apartheid campaign concerning Israel, and yes, indeed, also rock stars who have been supporting uh, this case. The next thing I want to mention, because this has been quite important, uh, uh, certainly in the discussions I've been having with the media, which is what is it that, that the law should be doing, right? Why is it not working? What is even the relevance of law here? The case is principally about functional immunity, and that's what my colleague is going to speak about more in a moment. But there are actually three particular functions that um, the law basically is there for. And we're not going to talk about the details of what the law says, but it's three functions here. The protection function, first of all, protection of civilians and humanitarian workers and infrastructure. And here we talk about schools, hospitals, civilian buildings, um, ambulance personnel, school teachers, but also prisoners of war protection of all these protected persons from inhuman treatment and other protection from other atrocity crimes. The second function is a regulatory function. There are limits, there are rules uh, to the conduct of war even. Um, for example, one shouldn't use white phosphorus directed against, deliberately directed against civilians and deliberately directed against civilian targets. It does include also the right of both state and non-state groups to carry out um, armed conflict, um, including resisting aggression within the strict humanitarian limits and to prohibit it by way of legislation, the commission of atrocity crimes. This is the second function. And the third function, which is its accountability function, and that's primarily why we are here today, which is to investigate and to prosecute individual violators for atrocity crimes primarily by way of criminal prosecution, but as in this case, also through civil litigation. So we have with us today um, three guests, uh, and I'm going to mention them in terms of their, uh, how they're going to be presenting. 
although I understand that Mr. Ziad is not going to be presenting today, and we respect that. We are very grateful again, I want to say, that you are here joining us today, Mr. Ziad. First, we have um, Helen Duffy, a full professor of law at Leiden University. She's attached to the Hrotius Center for International Legal Studies. She's also a practicing lawyer for more than 25 years with human rights in practice. She has extensive litigation experience, including with regional and international human rights courts in bodies, including the African, European, and Inter-American systems, the ECOWAS courts, UN human rights bodies, and of course, national courts, as in this case. And this, of course, is an appeal to the European Court of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms. We have also Wout Albers, who since 2012 is a practicing lawyer at the Dutch Bar, currently part of Telemann Advocate, and he is acting in this case on behalf of the Global Justice Association, which is a prize-winning collective of uh, global justice lawyers. And then again, also to mention Mr. Ismail Ziada, he is a scholar, he's trained in the political economy of development, also very relevant to the work we do here at ISS. He's also a father, a brother, a son, a friend, and a social justice activist. Thank you very much for all of you who have joined us, and I'd like now to hand over to Helen Duffy. Yeah, so as has been said, I'm Helen Duffy, um, and I have the honour to be uh, representing Mr Ismail Ziada in this case that's going to the European Court of Human Rights this week. Um, in my introduction, I'll just make a few comments about the background to the case, about the Dutch case that has given rise to the case that will now be presented to the European Court in Strasbourg um, this week. Um, so first of all, uh, by way of background, um, I'll, perhaps I should say that the, for those of you who are not as familiar with the European Court of Human Rights, and I'm sure many of you are, but just to emphasise that this is a case that is being brought against the Netherlands before the European Court of Human Rights for the denial of justice towards our client, Mr Ismail Ziada, in the decisions that the Dutch courts took to dismiss his civil claim against former Israeli military commanders in respect of war crimes that were committed in Gaza in 2014. In terms of the background facts, um, I would just make uh, a few points in order to locate our discussion on the case that's being filed this week. First of all, by way of background, um, our client lost six of his close family members in an airstrike on the 20th of July 2014. Um, that included uh, his mother, brothers, sister-in-law and nephew, so individuals ranged between 70 and 12 years of age. Um, this attack, uh, directed against civilians, was part of a broader, intense military operation known as Operation Protective Edge. Um, that operation that was conducted between the 7th of July 2014 and the 26th of August 2015 involved 6,000 airstrikes over a 51-day period. It gave rise to what a UN independent inquiry described as unprecedented devastation, obviously unprecedented at that time. It documented, the UN inquiry documented a death toll of 2,251 Palestinian lives um, and a massive number more uh, of injuries, including permanent disabilities, over 11,000 Palestinians. Uh, left disabled as a result of that operation. It described enormous destruction of civilian infrastructure, um, massive numbers of displaced persons, 500,000 people displaced at that time. Obviously, these facts are very pertinent and they're very familiar to us um, as we look at what is unfolding in Gaza today. Um, the Commission of Inquiry also pointed to uh, the fact that these did consist of very serious violations of human rights and humanitarian law um, and pointed to the commission of war crimes. In particular, the Commission of Inquiry emphasised the role of commanders in this operation, the fact that the operation in the way that it was planned and implemented targeting civilians was something that a reasonable commander would have been aware of the disproportionate impact on civilians um, and civilian infrastructure, 
um, and therefore pointing to the commission of war crimes by uh, military commanders at that time. The other part of the background facts that I do want to underline, because it's relevant to our case as well as to what's happening today, is of course that following this commission of war crimes in 2014, there has been absolute impunity in respect of those crimes. There has been no adequate investigation in Israel or elsewhere. There has been absolutely no access to justice for the victims, including our client, Mr. Ziada. There are many reasons for that that are outlined um, in many different reports, including United Nations reports, reports of civil society organizations, in the case that was brought to the Dutch courts and in the case that we're now bringing to the European Court of Human Rights. But the fact is that before Israeli courts, as a result of law that exists, it is not a possibility to bring any kind of civil action like the type that Mr. Ziada brought to the Dutch courts. That is not an option. It is precluded by law to bring any kind of action in relation to war crimes in Gaza. There are many reasons for that, as I say, that we can go into if people uh, want to ask about that in question. So the fact is, in the, in the face of these very serious war crimes, the lack of access to justice, the complete impunity, and the contribution that we know that, that kind, those kind of violations and impunity contribute to ongoing violations that we're seeing today um, in, in Gaza, it's particularly important, I think, to challenge the response of the Dutch courts, and that's what I'm going to turn to now. Um, I'm not a Dutch lawyer, I'm an international human rights lawyer. Um, of course, if there are specific questions about Dutch law and process, I do have my Dutch co-counsel sitting beside me, Wout Albers. Um, but what happened in the Dutch courts is essentially the facts that we are now alleging before the European Court of Human Rights. Um, and what happened when Mr. Ziada brought his case to the Dutch courts um, is that the Dutch courts took an extremely broad-reaching approach to immunities. It took the approach that essentially blanket, absolute immunity protected former military commanders from being sued in Dutch courts. So the case that was brought against two former military commanders by Mr. Ziada was therefore not considered by the Dutch courts. This is not a case where the courts considered the issues and decided against the applicant. It's absolutely not that. It's a case where the Dutch courts said they would not and could not even look at the facts of his case or in any way proceed with this claim because there was this absolute immunity for former officials um, under international law. Our claim that's now being brought before the European Court of Human Rights says that that is a denial of justice, that it's a violation of his right to access justice. We should also say by way of context that this is not what we might call a universal jurisdiction case as such. We're not claiming here that the Dutch courts have to open their doors to every um, applicant, to every victim of serious crimes around the world. This is a case where the applicant did have access to court. There was jurisdiction in the case, he argued, his counsel argued. The court didn't even consider the question of jurisdiction, still less the facts, because they said immunity applies and is absolute and prevents the court from considering any of these other issues. So the issue at the heart of the case is a challenge to this blanket notion of immunity as completely preventing access to justice uh, in this particular case. Um, our claim is based on, I won't give you an awful lot of legal detail, but I'll just tell you the, the, the core elements of why this constitutes a violation of our applicants, of, of our clients' rights, sorry. Um, first of all, the central, central piece of this claim is that this is a violation of his access to justice under Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, Article 6 makes clear that individuals do have right to access a court in order to bring claims in relation to violations of their rights. It's clear from that provision and from uh, human rights jurisprudence that if there are to be restrictions on access to justice, those restrictions have to be justified by the state as strictly necessary and proportionate in all of the circumstances. So this proportionality test 
involves the court looking very carefully at all of the relevant circumstances and deciding whether or not um, any restriction on access to justice can be strictly justified. It's our submission that what the Dutch courts approach by simply dismissing the case as a case of absolute immunity failed to engage in that proportionality analysis. It failed to look at all of the facts and circumstances of this extremely important case. In particular, we would say that it was manifestly unreasonable the fact that the court didn't take into account a couple of really crucial aspects of this case that I want to, to underline. One of them is, of course, that this is a case of systematic war crimes. This is the most, we are talking about the most serious violations of international law. Very long standing uh, crimes under international law, violations of what we call use Kogan's norms, the norms with the highest protection in the international order. The court also failed to take into account and was very dismissive that it was simply irrelevant to look at what would the implications be of refusing to consider this case. In particular, were there any alternative mechanisms that were available to the applicant? As I've already said, there were no such remedies available in Israel, no such remedies before Palestinian courts. This was the one opportunity that the applicant had to bring this civil claim in relation to these very serious crimes. The issue of immunities in international law has been a complicated one over time, that has to be acknowledged. But we would say that there's overwhelming evidence that at this point in time, as the law has evolved, that it is simply unreasonable, manifestly unreasonable, to refuse to take into account the nature of the crimes, the seriousness of the case, the fact that this is the only opportunity uh, for justice that was available um, to, to our client. So our claim, based on Article 6 of the Convention, is that there has been a denial of justice. It will set out the basis for that. It will explain how the law and immunity has evolved over time. It will also explain, and I'm sure we're all familiar sitting here in The Hague, uh, with the fact that broader international law has evolved very much over time. It's now very well established um, that uh, the importance of justice the importance of ensuring access to justice and reparation, as well as accountability for crimes under international law, is a key concern of the international community. It cannot sit alongside an absolute approach to immunity when it comes to war crimes committed by uh, former officials. Um, in conclusion, I would say, uh, perhaps I should also say that another aspect of our claim is that, that we do suggest that the, the extreme denial of justice in this particular case is discriminatory. It has a discriminatory impact on Palestinians that have nowhere else to go. Um, it would not be the same if there were other avenues for justice. But in the context of this case, we would say that the disproportionate effect that the court's approach, its dismissive approach, um, has on Palestinians, um, like my client, uh, means that this is also a case of discrimination as well as denial of access to justice. So in conclusion, I think this is a, an extremely important case. It's important, of course, for Ismail Ziada uh, and his family, first and foremost. It's important to expose the injustice, expose the extreme violations and the injustice um, that has surrounded these violations. Um, and to try to seek justice for him. But it's also emblematic, as we've said, of broader systematic human rights violations, the violations of IHL, the systematic war crimes that we have seen before and since, and the need to take seriously the right of victims to see justice in respect of those violations, the need to grapple with the fact that if we continue um, to ignore violations of the past, that we will see them continue to be repeated, and we hardly need to say that in the context of what's happening in, in Gaza today. Thank you very much. I've got two questions, one related to the ICL theory of your work, and the other related to theory under immunities. Under ICL, Helen, if I understood you correctly, one of the 
conceivable war crimes that, that occurred during this attack was violation of the rule of proportionality. Is, is, if, if, if I'm right about that, if I understood you correctly, can you talk a little bit about how you and Vought, um have made your proportionality calculus in 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 vis-a-vis -vis this event to justify that it was a violation of this rule of IHL and vis-a-vis -vis immunity i understand that the claim is targeting two former israeli or current former israeli military commanders um, and I'm trying to understand whether the fact that they're, they are military, they were military commanders at the time as opposed to civilian superiors, does that change the underlying immunity analysis at all? It's an opportunity to clarify a couple of points that I may not have been as clear on as perhaps I should have. Um, I think in relation to these particular attacks, these were attacks that were directed against the family. Um, directed against, they were direct attacks uh, directed against civilians and civilian objects, but they did take place in the context of a broader campaign which involved various violations of humanitarian law and war crimes, directing attacks at civilians and civilian objects, the failure to take the necessary precautions that, that you're very familiar with under international humanitarian law, the failure of commanders to take the necessary precautions in respect to the protection of civilians and indeed disproportionate impact on civilians. Um, this is not something that we need to get into in detail in this European Court of Human Rights case, which is really about the Dutch court's failure to take jurisdiction of this case. But what is clear and what is important, I think, is the fact that we are talking about you know, what has been referred to by the UN inquiry um, as, as you know, strong indications, clear indications that there were war crimes. So it's not necessary for us. This is not a criminal investigation. I think your question does remind us of some of the challenges that can arise in conducting a criminal investigation in relation to disproportionate attacks on civilians. And that's something that we're seeing in, in Gaza today. But for the purposes of this, um, this case, I don't think that is something that we need uh, t to, to look at. Um, again, I think in respect of your... Uh, question. I think um, in relation to the nature of the commanders, yes, these were uh, commanders who at that time uh, were involved in uh, senior uh, military positions and in devising and implementing the policy. That's why we would say that their culpability, if you like, is particularly important. That's why it's particularly important that there is some kind of justice, criminal or civil, in respect of, uh, of their um, of, uh, yes, their, their conduct as commanders and the failure uh, to take the necessary precautions. Um, I think you were asking whether or not uh, the fact that they were military rather than civilian would have an impact. Um, again, our case, I, I think the answer is not for our purposes. I mean, for our purposes, what matters is that there were, you know, there were strong indications of war crimes and of their engagement in those war crimes. Uh, in fact, before the Dutch courts, it wasn't in dispute that they were instrumental uh, in the carrying out of these attacks. Um, and therefore, we would say it's essential that the Dutch courts allow access to justice, that they consider this claim. That's what we're talking about after all. Not that the Dutch courts didn't come to the right decision, but that they refuse to even consider this claim. Um, I don't think the fact that they're military commanders means that they should have, that, that they were military commanders, means that they should have any greater protection um, under international law than if they were not. The issue here is uh, functional immunity in terms of uh, international law. Did they have immunity as former officials? That's the question that the Dutch court took the view um, that as former officials, they were entitled to this very broad immunity. Um, the fact that they were military rather than civilian was not at the heart of the case, but certainly the Dutch courts took the view that because they were senior um, officials acting in the conduct of their official duties, that they were entitled to immunity. Um, and you know, our point is that be the military, civilian or others, if you're engaged in war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, you're not entitled to that immunity under international law. 
perhaps it's also an opportunity to say that you know there is a some distinction between state immunity and the immunity of individuals functional immunity under international law this case only concerns former officials and whether they today enjoy functional immunity protection from any action uh, civil action before foreign courts and we would say that's that's uh, um, an untenable proposition in light of developments in international criminal law but also developments in international uh, civil jurisdiction uh, globally in recent years. During the course of your career, um, you have also been involved in the Pinochet uh, case, if I can, uh, if I'm not, am I incorrect in thinking so? Um, this, of course, was a case that also concerned functional immunity. Um, can you also, in the course of having just worked on so many of these different kinds of cases, uh, recall uh, the extent to which this really brings back memories of what was at stake there, also for the various actors involved in this, uh, the victims of Pinochet's regime, uh, the many different lawyers and NGOs involved, and here we have, for example, the Nuhanovich Foundation, the Palestine Justice Campaign, and, uh, of course, your organization, uh, Global Justice Association, represented, as well as not least the European Legal Support Center, all NGOs that have a sort of stake in this. Um, there is a strong legal precedent, but there's also a very strong um, sort of understanding that uh, these very serious crimes were not meant to, to, to uh, protect one, to create immunity from prosecution, be that criminal prosecution or civil prosecution. Can you maybe reflect a little bit on that? And then again, open up to the audience uh, to ask uh, questions. Just raise your hand and let me know. In the Pinochet case, the really important principle that was established was that even a former head of state, so the head of state that really embodied, uh, had personal immunity while a head of state, um, that really embodied the state, right, and embodied the idea of state immunity, even a former head of state could not enjoy immunity for these kind of egregious crimes, that it flew in the face back in 1998, before the International Criminal Court even existed, before there'd been many other developments um, in uh, international law and practice, that even then it was found that that was not an acceptable proposition given how international law was developing. Uh, and yet, sadly, we still have to win um, these types of arguments in the context of uh, Palestinians and the egregious war crimes that they are subject to uh, today. Um, perhaps just to say, you mentioned the organisations that are involved, and I think, I think it is very important. Uh, I think I just want to really uh, honour the, the courage of my client in bringing this claim. Um, to say it's not easy for him is trite, uh, but it's enormously difficult not only to have suffered everything he's suffered and continues to suffer, but to be willing to take forward this action, but also the, the civil society organisations that have supported um, him and supported this cause of justice for Palestinians and also for justice more broadly. Um, because as I said, it is about Palestinians, but it's also about victims of war crimes. Looking around the world, how little accountability and reparation we take, we afford to victims. We talk about victims all the time, don't we? Politicians love to talk about victims. When it comes to actually delivering reparation for war crimes, um, the record, I think, um, is extremely dismal, and, and this case really epitomises that. But it wouldn't be possible, I think, without the support of the civil society organisations, just as Pinochet wouldn't have been possible without the commitment of Chilean NGOs and solidarity movements around the world. Thank you very much, Helen. I wanted to know whether there's any previous case law of victims of war crimes or human rights violation that were denied access to justice and then challenged a member state of the ECHR on Article 6. Thank you. Thank you. So that, that's a good question. I could give you the very long answer. I could give you the lecture, could become the professor that gives you the long answer. There has been a lot of jurisprudence. There have been a lot of challenges, broadly speaking, but there have been very, very few that have actually dealt with this issue. In fact, I would say that there are no claims that have dealt with the same issues that we're dealing with today. There have been claims um, on the national level, I have to say, practice is varied, and we acknowledge that in the brief, that in a number of domestic systems around the world, courts have found 
that the fact that it's war crimes means that immunities, these type of immunities should not apply. But there have also been other cases that have gone the other way, where states perhaps applying local laws and statutes, um, as in the United States and Canada, have found that immunities did apply. So that's the national level. On the international level, there have been some, but quite limited number of uh, complaints that have challenged in the context of um, individual cases of torture, um, which of course are also very serious violations of international law. But there have not been any claims that have dealt with what we're talking about here, which is systematic commission of war crimes by former officials. Um, so we are, we do have, um, I think, a strong basis in jurisprudence to argue that this is a violation. Um, there is also conflicting practice. It's a complex issue because there has been a lot of denials of justice uh, to victims around the world, but there have not been cases um, that have dealt with the specific uh, facts and legal issues that we're dealing with today. So in that sense, I think it's a particularly important uh, opportunity really for um, the European Court to, to clarify that um, you know, that access to justice does require that the rights of victims of war crimes be taken seriously and uh, considered in the mix. The ECHR did have a case in, I believe, 2014, Jones versus the United Kingdom, that dealt with this question. It was also an Article 6 uh, right to access thing that had to do with functional immunity. Um, that case, I believe, involved torture, so it wasn't a war crime. Can you say something a little bit about how this case is functionally different from that? Because, of course, in that case, they ruled that, um, yeah, the, the proceedings couldn't move forward because uh, the, yeah, the individuals had immunity in, in, against civil lawsuits. Yeah, thank you for that question. It really it, it deepens the very broad answer I gave earlier. And, of course, I did have in mind the Jones against the United Kingdom case is a key case. Um, before the European Court, and as you've said, it's one of the it's one of the cases I, I had in mind when I said that there have been cases of individual torture. I intervened in the Jones case. I had a small role in that case when I was in the United Kingdom back in the day, um, and did argue against the application of immunities to torture too. Um, and as you say, the European Court did um, reach a judgment that has has. I think is a very unfortunate judgment because it was very deferential to the fact that the UK courts. Um, afforded immunity in respect of torture. And in the context and in the particular facts of that case, the European Court deferred to the UK and they said, we're not finding a violation of Article 6 because they took the view that the UK courts had taken a view on immunity. So clearly there are comparisons to this case. I would say there's also a number of things that are different about this case. One is the nature of the crimes. We are talking about systematic war crimes. These are clearly crimes under international law of a particular gravity. Um, and we, as I say, we hardly need to be reminded of, of that today. Um, we're also talking about 2014. In fact, that case based itself on practice around the world up to 2010, because it was looking back at what was available at the time. That's a long time ago, right? We have 14 years of experience in the development of international law on victims' rights, on reparation, on international justice. So I would say these facts are different. Another difference is, is that um, in that case, they were looking at the application of a statute in the UK. Here, the Dutch court said that they found that it was established beyond all reasonable doubt. They said there were no gray areas, that under customary international law, there was functional immunity, even in respect of war crimes. I would say that's, a, that's, we would argue that that's really an implausible interpretation of where the law stands today. So it's different on the facts, but yes, there are similarities. Yes, this is a challenge that we need to address. I would also say that the law has evolved. And finally, I would say that, that the Jones case has been subject to very harsh criticism. In fact, if you look in the judgments of the European Court, there are a few cases um, where the court has taken a... Uh, a quite a deferential view on this question. Those cases have been subject to very harsh criticism within the cases, strong dissenting judgments, for example, saying, surely not in respect of serious use Kogan's crimes under international law. So it's an issue of dissent within the European Court. We see that in the narrow uh, majorities and the strong dissents. And it's been subject to great criticism outside. So I hope that it is an opportunity 
Uh, while this case is different, and while we are asking the court to decide on the basis of the facts of this case, it's also an opportunity to clarify how the court reconciles its human rights convention with broader international law, including the developments in relation to international justice. If I can, uh, can broaden that, uh, um, obviously the argument is being brought very well uh, here, uh, and it's a very broad argument. But in that broad bit of the argument, it's also very important that actually the Dutch government has taken a stance against this uh, functional uh, uh, immunity um, in, uh, in, in a very broad way. So basically, the Dutch government has already said that they want to make the exception, and the courts in the Netherlands, basically, uh, they don't refer to that at all. Basically, what they refer to is only the international customary uh, rule, which, uh, if you do it like this, you can never change a customary rule. So uh, it, it's very important also to, to add that, I think, to that broader discussion. I think that last point is very important, actually, that the pr approach that the Dutch courts, when they said there was no question about this, does go against other developments here within the Netherlands in terms of also um, the advisory committee on international law that serves uh, within uh, the Netherlands, an expert opinion that has uh, looked at this question of uh, functional immunities, has taken quite a different uh, approach. So that's one example among many others. We also see developments in International Law Commission um, but one example among others of how I think it, it's uh, become quite implausible to say that this is so straightforward that the Dutch courts really had no choice but to apply customary international law. So thank you for adding. Thank you very much for this extremely illuminating presentation. I wonder if you could explain for us what is the underlying principle behind the immunity of states in the first place and their functionaries in the second place? What is it that states gain with this, perhaps, perhaps uh, avoiding reputation damage, one could imagine that, but is there a legal principle or is there some other kind of principle that underpins this apparently rather broad right to immunity for states and their functionaries? Yeah, what, one, of the, one of the main things that underlies this is um, uh, immunity is between states. So basically, one court, the one, uh, court of, an, of one state should not be judging about, uh, about another state. But in this case, obviously, the functional immunity is, is a, a little bit uh, more um, detailed uh, in that sense, because there are many cases where uh, where former uh, former well, Pinochet, for example, but also uh, other uh, people that high military officials have been prosecuted, have been uh, going uh, basically going to court. So that's not the, the, then we're not talking about a judgment about the state anymore. Um, plus, yeah. So there's a lot of different different. Uh, the functional immunity question is definitely different from the immunity of a state. Uh, and immunity of the state also doesn't mean that you can, like we're, we're talking about uh, sy systematic war crimes, which um, uh, like that's considered yes, cogens, but which normally between states is, is done by the International Criminal Court. Um, so within states, uh, state, the high state officials, uh, when we're talking about uh, presidents, uh, it's, it's the idea that the criminal court does this. Uh, but actually, with uh, with uh, with the functional immunity, uh, this has not been lifted necessarily. And also, well, uh, we don't see any uh, accountability anywhere else. So that's also uh, one of the reasons why we, why this case is not been brought on a universal jurisdiction, but on on basically the exemption uh, that the Dutch law offers that you can actually bring a case like this, which. Uh, if there is a sufficient link uh, to uh, to the Netherlands, which of course Mr. Ziala has this this link because he's living here uh, and has a Dutch nationality, so that that's also uh, yeah just to broaden a little bit. I agree with you. I think that's that's absolutely right. And maybe just to bring it back to you know this question about what is the purpose of immunity, um, I think is important. Precisely as uh, as Bout says, you know the difference between the state and functional immunity. You know the idea and the Dutch courts talk about. Um, comity and relations between states. Uh, so the idea is that states and sitting heads of states or foreign ministers would be able to operate to discharge their stately functions without political interference from foreign courts. 
um, they would be able to, you know, foreign ministers would be able to travel and do what they need to do uh, on the international stage. This, the state would be able to, to operate. Um, but this is a very broad notion, right? Comity and, and facilitating the international relations uh, between states. Um, and it, of course, it can't be part of the purpose of that immunity to protect individuals from accountability. That's really, again, out of step with what we're seeing that we've spoken about in terms of international developments. But the Dutch courts did take a very broad approach. And one of our arguments is that they should have really looked at whether there was a legitimate aim that was being pursued here in granting this immunity. That's part of the access to justice test under the European Convention on Human Rights. The court has to ask, is there a legitimate aim that's being pursued in restricting access to justice? And is it proportionate, uh, the measure that's been taken? And the Dutch courts took a very broad approach to that. They didn't look at whether or not it could be justified as legitimate to grant immunity in uh, this particular case. But what they did also emphasise, and I thought it was interesting if we look at the detail of, of the judgment, that they did emphasise the, um, the interests of the State of Israel in a very broad way. They took into account a diplomatic note that had been presented by uh, Israel. They did recognise that it's, this is not a case against the state. The state would not necessarily have to respond to this case. It wouldn't have to pay damages. It wouldn't have to do anything. This is not a case against the state. But they said that the state might feel obliged to support these former officials. Well, it, it might feel obliged to do that or it might not, but surely that is not this, you know, incredibly strong principle of international law that state immunity was meant to protect. It was meant to protect the ability of states to function, the ability of their heads of state and foreign ministers to travel around the world unhindered. Um, and it's very difficult, I have to say. It's all, the case is also an opportunity, of course, for the Dutch state to reflect on its position. As we've said, they have not been in favour. The government has not been in favour of a broad approach to immunities in the past. But it is important to really think about what are the principles we're trying to protect here? Not to protect people, I think, from, from justice. And, you know, are friendly relations between states actually more important than international justice or accountability for war crimes and preventing those war crimes in the future? So.